baked beans. We've all got a tin in our cupboard, right? But have you ever wondered where the beans grow and how they make it to our plates? Join me as I chat with Lincolnshire arable farmer, Andrew Ward, MBE, who has been trialling Herico beans as a new crop in the quest to get Britain more self-sufficient. Tune in if you want more. Welcome to the Countryside Kitchen Meats, a food and farming podcast. I'm Millie Fife, your host. I'm a mum of two, farmer's wife, food producer, and passionate about flying the flag for British food and farming. Today we'll be chatting to Andrew Ward, MBE, a Lincolnshire arable farmer who wears many hats and is currently trialling a new crop on his farm. Then I've got a few time-saving hacks when it comes to mealtime preparation and some recipes to share, meaning you can juggle family life with the children and cook a tasty, nutritious meal too. Okay, let me introduce you to my guest. Andrew Ward, MBE, farms 650 hectares of arable land near Lednam in Lincolnshire. He is a McDonald's flagship farmer and has hosted two cereals events, which are large agricultural events, and has also won Farmers Weekly Arable Farmer of the Year. He received the NFU Farmers Weekly Farming Champion Award for setting up Forage Aid in 2013, where he delivered donated forage and straw to help farmers in the north and west during the snow and in the Somerset floods of 2014. Forage Aid received full charity status in April 2015 and was very active in the Cumbrian floods. Andrew was awarded an MBE for his services to agriculture in November 2014. Now, I've known Wardy for many, many years through the various roles within the industry we've both held. In fact, when he received his award for the Farming Hero from the Farmers Weekly Award in 2013, I was also in the finalist category. Unbeknown to me, my husband had put me forward and I was runner up to Wardy. (laughs) (laughs) Wardy Wardy is is very active on social media and posts about life on the farm via Twitter and on his YouTube vlog. And he is currently trialling a new crop this season, baked beans. Who doesn't have a can of those in their cupboard? So without further ado, let's chat to Andrew. Hello, how are you, Woody? Hello, Millie. I'm very good, thank you. Desperate for some rain, but apart from that, all good. Yeah, uh, I know that feeling. I know that feeling. I mean, on a on a kind of agricultural scale, you can't just go out with a watering can, can you? <laughs> no. And it was always going to happen. You know, we had the long wet period of, of uh, March and April when it never stopped raining. And and God always has a habit of, of evening out with the weather. And so we, we, we knew we were going to be in for a long dry spell. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think... You know, generally th- things are looking pretty well, though, aren't they? I mean, yeah, we could do with some rain, but in 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 sort of grand scheme of things, everything's growing, and and you know, yield should be okay. Yes, I think we're, we're, our winter crops are looking looking good. Um, our spring crops are very up in the air at the minute because we're on very heavy, difficult clay soils here. That that obviously they need to be managed differently to sandy soils. We can't get on them when it when it's wet. And we have to bide our time and be very patient. So we didn't get a lot of our spring crops weren't that weren't planted until April, May time, which is ridiculously late, probably two mm. months later than normal. And I've never, ever in all my time of farming, I've never planted crops as late as that. And so what whether what we're going to get at harvest is a complete uh, is a complete unknown. And um, it relies entirely on the weather as well and us having adequate rainfall now, because if we don't, the spring crops are going to be extremely poor. Mm, mm. So how how long have you been farming in Lincolnshire for? My father started the farm in 1958. He moved from uh, Lincoln itself, from a village the other side of Lincoln, in fact, RAF, near RAF Scampton, where the Red Arrows and the Dam Busters are, uh, have been based. And he moved from there to th- this village, which is about 17 miles from where he started in 1958. And... Um, he started the farm here by renting the farm that I'm sat at now, that we now own. And then he bought that farm in 1962 and then took on the tenancy of another farm in the village. Um, and that's the farm that I've got the life term tenancy of as well. And, and so I, I went to agricultural college when I was when I was 18 
and uh, and had two years at, at Rise Home at, at the Agriculture College in Lincoln, that's now part of Bishop Burton. And uh, and then I left there and then came back on the farm when I was 20 and then sort of worked on the farm as a normal farm uh, labourer or, or tractor driver, call it what you like, for probably five or six years. And and um, my father was sort of just told me what to do. And, and I just did it like one of the, the farm stuff that we have now. And then it wasn't until probably I got towards maybe late 20s, maybe 30, when I started to be asked my opinion on a few things and I started mm-hmm. to have a bit more input into into what we did on the farm and the machinery and that sort of thing. And and, and farming, as you know, Millie, it's, it's, it's very, it's not like other in industry where at 65, dead on 65, you retire. Some farmers are still farming right into their 80s. And, there's, and, and farming as well is one of those industries where you never really said, right, th- from this day now you're boss. You know, I gradually got into it more and more. I had more responsibility and gradually my father had less responsibility without really him saying to me that this is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And and um, and then gradually, I suppose, over the course of a few years, I found that I was, I, I was sort of running it myself. So it, it's, it's very different to any other industry where you're not told that, right, you are now going to be, this is your job, your, your company, your business from now on. And I think a lot of farmers are like that. Yeah, no, I see that so much. Um, succession planning is a huge thing, isn't it? Whether mm. or not it's kind of a, a written down plan or, you know, uh, some, something that just kind of happens over time. And, you know, for for the good and the bad, I think, well, I mean, we could talk all, all day, couldn't we, just on succession? Um, but mm. uh, you, uh, you were Lincolnshire born and bred and a yellow belly. Yes, <laughs> true yellow belly. Yes, yeah. that's right. Lived yeah. around the village that led them all my life. Yeah, excellent. And and so what, what crops do you grow and who do you supply? We don't grow any sort of salad crops or, or anything like that. So we're what I call the boring crops in a way. We're growing, <laughs> we're growing winter wheat. We have grown spring wheat. Um, and I'll explain the difference between winter and spring in a minute. But we have grown spring wheat in the past. We haven't got any this year. We grow spring, we grow spring malting barley. And malting barley obviously means it goes to make whiskey or beer. Um, and the barley also grows into breakfast cereals. Mm. Um, I do quite a lot with schools as well, which I'll talk about that if, in, in, in a little while if you if you'd like to like me to. So schools are an important part of what I do and, and where the food comes from. So barley is an important part of that. Um, and also we grow um, sugar beet, another important crop for us. We have a processing factory at Newark, which is only 11 miles away from here. So so field to, to, to factory is very, very short, which, yeah. of course, is good for the environment. We are also growing um, oats as well. And the oats we grow up, they call them naked oats, which means they don't have a husk on the outside. And they're predominantly grown for the pet food um, market. Ah, so, okay. so cats, dogs, guinea pigs, rabbits, um, that sort of thing. Some do go into, into animal feed, livestock feed, but a lot of what we grow, the oats we grow, um, and we have a premium for that. We're, we're, we're paid we're paid around forty five pounds per ton over the feed wheat price for those oats um, because they are sort of classed as a specialist crop. Mm. And then another crop we grow are beans as well. And and beans are are good because they're a good break crop. Um, and uh, so when we say a break crop, it means we don't grow wheat, 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 wheat continually year after mm. year on some land. We do on the very heavy, difficult soils because we get good yields from that. But beans for us on our medium soils and our our, our um, soils that are in the sugar beet rotation are really good because they are uh, cheaper to grow than other break crops mm. and they leave nitrogen behind because beans will pull nitrogen down from the atmosphere and absorb that into the plant and then release that nitrogen into the soil, which then means the following wheat crop um, is cheaper to grow because we don't need to put so much nitrogen on uh, yeah. you know, artificial fertilizer because the the plant the previous crop has left it. So beans for us and and, and they're good for the soil because the roots go down a really long way and so yeah. those sort of soil conditioner. Um, and we used to grow oilseed rape. We stopped about three years ago. Uh, that was always been a very important crop for us. And um, with our McDonald's flagship status, I was extremely proud of that because. There are only 23 farms in the whole of Europe that have got the McDonald's flagship status. And there's there's us uh, in, in the UK. And I think there's one other farm maybe in Ireland that's got it for beef. Uh, but uh, I was extremely proud of that and still am 
yeah. but just at the minute we're having a, a, a sort of a holiday from all seed rape because of uh, it's very difficult to keep the crop alive at the moment because of the uh, insects that eat it once we once it germinates through the ground because the the government banned neonicotinoid seed treatment and that made it very difficult for to grow the crop. Yeah. So so that's a sort of broad um, look at what we grow. We we grow barley quite a, a lot because it's a very competitive crop. It smothers the ground quickly, yeah. um, stops the light getting into the soil. And for us, that's important because we have a weed called black grass. Yeah. That it, it is a grass weed. And its name comes from the fact now this time of year when it's coming out above the top of the wheat crop and it's in flower, the head of the, of black, of the black grass is very dark grey. So that's mm. why it's called black grass. But it is the most damaging weed in the whole of the country mm. to, for taking yield grows very quickly in in the soil it smothers out wheat plants is extremely competitive and and you need a very competitive crop to uh, to help smother it out because um herbicides that were dealing with it um are, are now not effective on the crop the black mm. grass is resistant to most herbicides apart from glyphosate or roundup uh, as most people know you can buy that in the garden center um, but obviously the garden centre version is a lot weaker than <laughs> yeah. the we use. So so for us, spring crops have been very important for us because of black grass and being able to get on top of black grass because yeah. it really does um, hammer you and hit you hard on yield if you get a bad uh, infestation of black grass, which this year it, it, it is bad. And if anybody driving about the country see a lovely green field of wheat uh, this time of year, or you, and then you suddenly see this grey tinge above the crop, mm. and the crop in big patches, like sort of four or five sizes of tennis courts in in mm. one patch. That ninety percent of the time will be black grass, and, it, yeah. and it's very damaging. Yeah, yeah, and it's not like you can just go and hand rogue it, is it? And just get a, you know, it is very invasive, isn't it? We we do we do hand rogue, but that's one of a um, a whole measure. We have what mm. I call a jigsaw of of, of control measures. And um, delayed planting of the wheat crop uh, in the autumn is one, so we can then spray the the the, uh, the field, the ground with with Roundup before we plant the next crop to kill off the black grass. That is a really good start to it. We then uh, put a pre-emergence herbicide on, which means we seal the soil surface after the crop is established, and that sort of seals it. And then any weeds come through, are picking up the the herbicide. But again. If you've got resistant black grass, that will only give you a level, a, a sort of a 20%, 30% control. And then we will hand rogue and we get a team in, in and we've got the team starting this week where we go up and down every field, only five metres apart, everybody's walking to mm. hand and take off the field the weeds. Mm. Um, and if we have a bad infestation in some fields, we've got a block of land not far from here that we've got wheat in it now but it's the first year we've had wheat for nine years. It's been continuous spring barley, been so bad for black grass. Mm. And, and so, um, uh, and spraying patches off is another thing. If we've got fields that's got the odd patch in it, we'll kill that patch and kill the crop in that patch to stop the weed from seeding. Mm. So, so minimizing seed return is everything. So, so yeah, we have about five or six different ways in which we're different things we do to try and get on top of black grass. Yeah, yeah. And and so would black grass be one of your biggest challenges or do you have, you know, what is your biggest challenge on the farm today? I wouldn't say black grass is our biggest challenge. It was eight or ten years ago, mm. but we've done so much to it to, the, to, to help control it. And, and I don't agree with a lot of people when they say they, you can't get on top of black grass. Mm. You can. And people have got black grass problems because they've been doing the same thing over and over again every year. You have to catch it out. You have to try and do something different. Um, otherwise, it, it will beat you. So I wouldn't say that is. I think my biggest challenge at the moment is regulations yeah. and trying to farm and produce food with a government that isn't supportive of what we're trying to do mm. and trying to remain competitive uh, while dealing with imports that are mm. coming into this country that are grown with products we're banned from using. Mm. I think that's our biggest challenge at yeah. me personally and as an industry yeah yeah because it's the same with with livestock farming isn't it you know the welfare standards uh with beef with sheep with pigs with poultry you know we're we're trying to adhere to such high welfare standards but actually cheaper foreign imports they're not 
adhering to the same kind of legislation that we do? No, no, absolutely, definitely not. And, and it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's livestock, as you say, if you look at America, Australia, they have all these massive feedlots, as they call mm. them, where you've got animals just, they're not grazing on grass because they, they can't grow grass. They're just, mm. they're, they're sort of wandering about these massive dust, fenced in dust bowls mm. and, and they're, they're fed, um, they're fed uh, feed. And some of them are fed hormone growth promoters to make them animals grow quicker so mm. they can actually in a year produce more animals. So the force, the forcefully grown to, to get to the, the weight where they need to be slaughtered. Mm. Um, and, and we don't do that in this country. That no. was bad. And yet we've, we get now the trade deal has only just been activated that was done with Australia. It was signed, I think, 18 months ago, and it's only just come into force on the 1st of June. And now we're going to be having food on our shelves that is produced welfare wise in a way that we're not allowed to do. So we, we get the government saying we must have cheap food. And mm. yet they're quite happy to import food that is produced in ways that are illegal here mm. and that are deemed uh, to be deemed in, in, a, in an inferior way for human health. Yeah. And it, it cannot be right. No, no. And there's also, they forget about the environmental impact as well of shipping that mm. produce from the other side of the world as well. I mean, I'm all about buy British, shop locally. You know, you're wearing your bite into British fleece on this, po you know, and, I, you know, we're, we're both sing from the same hymn sheet, don't yeah. we? And it's just, it's so frustrating because obviously we, you know, we're trying to run a business, we're trying to produce food and we've just always got so much up against us, ourselves, haven't we? Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. and and I think this is this is the thing. When you start to look at it, there's so many untruths told about about agriculture. And one of the biggest things to me, and you've hit it on the head, is when we're importing food from Australia and America and all these countries miles and miles away, the footprint, the carbon footprint of getting that food here is, is colossal. And the one biggest myth is that agriculture is the biggest contributor to climate change. Mm. And it's absolute rubbish because mm. it is one of the lowest. British agriculture, and I won't say UK, worldwide agriculture because we are lower than a mm. lot of other countries. British agriculture com contributes around 9% mm. to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I've seen figures of British agriculture as 30%, 50%, 60%. It's absolute rubbish. We're under 10 percent as a whole as a whole industry. Livestock is around six percent and arable production, food production is around or growing crops is around three. Mm. So we're less than 10 percent of a nation. And yet transport is around 27 percent mm. contributing towards greenhouse gas emissions. And yet our government are quite happy to sign trade deals and bring food in from the other side of the world. It's yeah. just wrong. Mm. Mm, yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Let's talk about this really exciting trial that you are. <laughs> you know, I saw, I saw the article the other day, and I was like, I've got to get Wardy on this podcast. <laughs> bait beans, harico beans. Tell me, how did you get involved with growing bait beans? We uh, uh, are an agri i farm, and agri is a, a nationwide distributor of advice, uh, plant protection products, fertilizers, and that sort of thing. And we are their I farm for Lincolnshire. So I stands for information. They have about 25 farms dotted around the UK uh, where we do lots of trials in conjunction with them. And they have lots of uh, contacts around the country. Mm -hmm. So we first tried these uh, hericot beans or, or baked beans, which they'll turn into, about five years ago on, on a sort of tabletop size trial, very, very small trial. We didn't harvest them. We just grew them to see what they growing would grow like. And they weren't very good. They, were, mm -hmm. they, were, they didn't perform at all. Um, and so we then tried them the next year and they were the same. But then Warwick University have been doing lots of plant breeding um, trials mm -hmm. over the last few years and have finally got to some varieties that are suitable to our climate. Because the biggest thing with baked beans are that they mostly have been grown in Canada mm -hmm. and they haven't had any varieties suitable to our soils and our climate. And that is why they've been imported. Now, when you look at the amount of beans that are used, there is um, one processing, the main processing plant or factory is in Wigan, and they 
produce around, uh, or the UK, sorry, the UK consumes around 2 million tins of baked beans a week, which <laughs> is a phenomenal amount. And, and it's so ludicrous that we are <laughs> having to import that volume of food and so to get involved in a trial like this naturally is is the way is is, is great. And you know me, Millie, I mm. never want to shirk a challenge or shirk mm. backing away from trying something new, irrespective of whether it, it makes money or not. Mm. And this was an ideal situation in that that scenario where mm. where I offered the the field and and Agri said, yeah, let let's go with it. So we've got this this sort of 13, 14 acre field right next to the yard here that has been in grass for the last five years. We've been growing haylage for local equestrian yards and, and horsey people. We've, we've stopped doing that now. So having uh, beans after grass is, is the best crop. Wheat after grass is struggles to establish and we get lots of issues. So having beans after grass is great. Mm. So it just perfect sense to try it. Mm. So we've got three varieties in this, in this field. One of them, um, Warwick University are fairly confident, like 90% confident, that it's good enough for, to actually can, because it's all very well growing it and haven't been able to grow it. It's then, it can it be processed? Can it be yeah. put it in? Can it be mixed with the sauce? Is the texture right? Does it give off the right properties? And is it able to be stored? And all there's lots of different yeah, things, yeah, yeah. not just growing it. So of this field, we've got um, three varieties in it. We've got two different drilling dates. So, and again, when I say drilling, I don't mean drilling a hole in the wall. Yeah. I, mean, I mean planting the crop. And, and this is another one of the, uh, the farming terms that, that probably some people listening might not, might not um, might wonder what we mean. Yeah. So whenever we say drilling, it means planting the crop. So we've got different planting dates to see, again, which these varieties best respond to. We have got some plots that's got um, fertilizer, starter fertilizer in. And that'll be a mix. That'll be a sort of concoction of phosphate, potash, magnesium, uh, sodium, and sulfur mm -hmm. to see if that has any effect on it. Um, we've then got also uh, some uh, covered some companion crop trials with it because the biggest problem with these type of beans are that they grow very low to the ground, similar mm -hmm. to, and you have a uh, you can have a job harvesting them and, and getting them off the floor. Yeah. So one of the things that Warwick University have found is difficult to, to, to achieve. So what we're doing here is we're putting a, a, what we call a companion crop, which is a different crop with these beans. To, so we've planted some black oats. So black oats are a different type of oats to the ones we grow. They grow, they put a very, have a very good root structure and they grow quite tall. And what our aim is, is to get the beans to grow up or with the oats. So the oats will pull the beans up and keep them up so that when we get the combine in, we can then harvest underneath them and harvest them and get more beans than, than what we have done in the past. Now, the only slight snag is people might say, well, you've got the oats you're combining. Uh, yes, but the crops will ripe at a different stage. Sure. But, but once the beans are harvested, w whatever stage the oats are at, they'll just be put over as a machine and they can sieve the oats out because the oats will be a lot smaller than the beans. Yes. So the oats will be separated from the beans and then the beans will go through. So that's another thing we're trying. And we're trying uh, companion crops to see if that helps with the harvest. Yeah. So we've got lots of different things going on in this field. And, and the, one of the other things besides trying the beans and seeing if they're good for, for the human consumption, we've actually got some seed multiplication going on in this field because there is very, very few tons of, of beans around the country mm. any around anywhere and so we're trying to multiply up the seeds so some of what we're um, growing here um, will get more seed to grow next year yeah it's it's a really technical um trial isn't it because it's mm. not it's not a very it's not a, it doesn't sound like a very simple crop but i think when you, you've kind of got to go through all of these um stages haven't you to obviously develop yeah. the crop uh, and the thing with it is that with with the amount of tins the amount of food we mm. use it seems ridiculous that we can't grow it or try to grow it in this country and if we can that will just improve our or our, our, our less reliance on imports yeah we need to grow more home home produced protein we need mm. to grow more home produced food it's classed as a novel crop 
But there are other crops that I'll be looking to hopefully try if we can, such as lupins is another one that's mm -hmm. not grown here really as a niche crop. We've got soya as well. There's a lot yeah. of soya imported and goes into livestock feed in this mm -hmm. country for sheep, pigs and, and cattle. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one is chickpeas. Yeah. Um, chickpeas goes into goes to make hummus or hummus, however it is mm -hmm. pronounced. And, <laughs> and, and, um, and that's another one. You know, the amount you see on a supermarket shelf of that, if we could grow our own chickpeas, which at the moment we struggle. Mm -hmm. So there's all these novel crops that we need to start mm -hmm. looking at less imports and trying to grow them here yeah and I, you know hopefully more farmers like you adopt this kind of ethos and kind of look at trialing different crops because if you don't trial them you're never going to know are you no, and, it, and, it, exactly. it is, and, and it's then sort of upscaling to make it commercially viable as well that's the biggest thing and that mm. is the where we're unsure at the minute as to how viable it is mm. but like everything you don't just get you don't just get perfect at doing it right in, in year no. one. And and there's lots of different techniques, as you've heard, what we've got to do. Mm. So it's, it's a very steep learning curve. And and I, I can just imagine this being something that we'll learn things every year for probably 10 years to yeah. fine tune and get the most from the crop. Yeah. So this is if, if, if it's a success, presumably it'll be something like Heinz jumping on or is it in conjunction with Heinz? So they, exactly. they'll be able to, yeah. Yes, they are. They are sort of involved in keeping an eye on it at the minute, but only, mm. a, 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 but just on a sort of a, a look, see, and advisory process. Yeah, the... yeah. Oh wow, you know that would be a, a hell of a marketing asset for them, won't it? If they yeah. got the, you know, it'd be brilliant. And mm. it, it's one of those things, like like I said in my intro, everyone's got a can of baked beans in their cupboard, but mm. you never actually appreciate uh you, you know you just pour them into a saucepan and off you go you don't yeah. really think about the whole supply chain no. as it were and where they grow where they've grown you know where they're, where they're established and and the fact that we don't grow them in this country so no mm. oh fantastic they were like that's exactly why i wanted to bring you on because i just thought my listeners would just really be very interested in kind of what you're up to um and we will follow um this story with interest yes yeah. But wouldn't it be great to open the kitchen cupboard and see a tin of baked beans there with a Union Jack on? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And, but, but touching on that, actually, Millie, that's one of the th another one of my gripes is that actual criteria, mm. the, the criteria for uh, allowing Union Jacks or being able to put a Union flag or a British flag on a food produce, mm. that wants changing because at the minute, the criteria is that if it's put in a packet in this country it can have a union jack on mm. so it's there can be food that comes from the other side of the world but because simply it's packed in this country is allowed to put a union jack mm. on and wrong it yeah. must be food grown in this country and nothing yeah. else yeah it can be yeah it's very misleading and i mean you know um sort of farm assurance and all the regulation again that we have to go through yeah. it's kind of like it's a mark that we are proud of and we want to kind of champion and get behind. But if, yeah, there, when you then really look at the sort of small print and it's just packaged in, you know, but when you pick it off the shelf, all you see is, you know, you think, oh yeah, I'm buying British, but actually are you? And I think mm. it's kind of like really looking into that a little bit more and kind of yeah. saying, ah, yeah. Um, so no, no, totally with you on that. And so do you enjoy cooking food at home? Do you enjoy cooking meals with um your family well i i do minimal cooking which is a shame but i do two dishes that i i uh, have always done very well and one is actually one of the most nutritious dishes i think and that's omelette yeah. it's simple to make but the amount of times i go to a hotel and ask for an omelette and it's appalling mm. and yeah, I do an omelette. And when you make an omelette, I just put two or three eggs together in, in a bowl, whisk it up. I'll always put cheese with it. And I put mm. cheese with it right at the start. Mm. Pour it into a very hot pan that's got a little bit of oil in it, only a very small amount. And then I just stir it up. And so when someone, if you were to say to me, what's the difference between scrambled egg and an omelette? I will say about a minute. That's the difference <laughs> because my, my omelette is just keep stirring and stirring and stirring it up till it's nearly set and then just smooth it out, let it set a bit more, flip it over like a, like a pancake. Mm. And because you air into it all the time you've been cooking it, it is so light and fluffy. Mm. Um, and I always have cheese, yes, but there are so many other things you can put in an omelette. And you can yeah. have a meal out of one omelette. You can put potato in, you can put tomatoes, 
mushrooms, onions, anything like that. Um, and, and the whole omelette itself can be different vegetables in it, but yet it's a meal. Yeah. And, oh, and, yeah. And, and eggs are, of course, eggs are very good for you as well. So yeah. that's one dish that I, I, I do. Um, and uh, in fact, I, it's been known when I've been into hotels and I've, I've sent it back because it's not right. And then <laughs> one's come back to me and it's not been right. And I, I'll say jump to go in the kitchen and show the chef how to make an omelette. So, <laughs> um, and, and then the, 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 other, the other one I'll, I'll, I've done as well as I can do is beef bourguignon. And I think that probably sort of goes back to my roots of, of beef being my favourite, favourite meat. Mm. Um, but beef bourguignon, again, is, is just lovely with it. some nice wine in, in, it, as, in, in the gravy and some nice mushrooms and, and onions as well and some really lovely tender, tender steak. And so they're my sort of, uh, they're my two dishes. And I'm afraid, I'm, yeah, I could do a, a roast. I think I could do a joint of beef. Um, I, I'm very sort of particular about beef. But I don't like it overdone. Mm. I don't like it uh, it mooing as such as this day, <laughs> too too well done. I like the juices set. Um, I don't like to cut into it and then be all blood in the bottom of the of the mm. carving tray. I like it to be pink, but not not sort of bloody if you like. Yeah. Uh, and I like car I like carving thin. There's mm. so many places you go where they ruin uh, a joint because they can't carve properly. Mm. They, mm. You know, you end up with this piece of beef on your plate, and if you if you'd asked for a steak, it would come half <laughs> off a joint of beef. And to my mind, nice and thin, carve it properly, nice and thin. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, no, I totally agree. And I know whenever I'm organising events, I know that if I'm if trying to feed um a group of farmers, beef is always a winner. <laughs> always. And, and lately, I, I um, my my nephew bought me um, bought us a a thermometer, a meat thermometer. Oh yeah, for cooking a joint, and it's one of these that you actually you put the sensor into the middle of the joint when it's cold. It's got a long about a meter long wire out to it to a little square sensor that magnetic, and put in it say say maybe fifty depends how you like your beef, but a really good tip for people is to get one of these. Put the centre of the probe, put the probe, push it in so it's in the centre of the joint, pop it in the oven so the wire then comes out the oven door and just sits there and it's fine, it doesn't hurt it. And then just watch on the t display and then set an alarm for a temperature. And I think 52 degrees for us is a nice sort of medium, medium rare joint where the juices are set. And then the alarm, you just leave it and walk away. And the alarm bleeps at you when the middle of that joint is at 50 degrees. Oh, two amazing. Oh, I love my techie gadgets. I I have... <laughs> Let it rest on the side and then it will carry on cooking for a little bit more. But but 52 degrees is about right to have a lovely, nice sort of medium, medium rare joint. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I'm going to have to look into that. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right how can people find out more about you andrew are you on you're obviously on social media just tell us a few of your links and things like that please yeah i i am um i'm sometimes known as the gobby one because <laughs> I, I do um put myself out there but i'm i'm a firm believer that if you don't put yourself out there uh, people don't understand how food is produced and and what we do and we do a lot for the environment we do a lot for nature and wildlife we don't mm. just food we produce food in conjunction mm. with looking at the wildlife and nature and environment and i'm a big believer that you can't have one without the other mm. and, and the government are all the time pushing to do more environmental things they want to take out an area of land um uh, the, the size of of, uh, of a county at the minute they want to take out an area of land by in i think in the next 40 years the size of about four hundred twenty thousand football pitches rewilding mm. Mm. but um, we, we we can't do that. We need to produce food in conjunction with their mm. body. I do a lot of promoting of that through social media and Twitter. Um, yeah, I do I do quite a lot on Twitter, and my my Twitter name is Wheat Daddy, and that's Wheat underscore Daddy because I am aware there is another Wheat Daddy on Twitter mm. that has no underscore to it. There's no break between mm. Wheat and Daddy. And some people tag that person into some of my tweets sometimes. So so I am on Twitter as Wheat Daddy. And uh, that's an important part. And I, you use, I do use Twitter a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's like a newspaper to me because you can get all sorts of news on it. Um, and so I use that. The farm is on Facebook. I personally don't have a Facebook account. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my partner, Rhonda, does. And the guys on the farm do. So the farm itself, that's Roy Ward Farms Limited, have a Facebook yeah. page. 
And then me personally, I, I focus quite a lot at the moment on YouTube. I put a, a, a video up every Sunday morning at 8 a.m. and another one if we're busy midweek on a Wednesday evening. And again, that really is, is to promote what we're doing to pr promote, uh, to produce food yeah. and what we're doing in helping the environment. And it's a snapshot on my life. If I go to meetings, if I go to conferences, if I go to shows, uh, I interview people just like you're doing this mm. with me. And, uh, and then, yeah, when we're planting crops, when we're harvesting, uh, all things like that and and I put good things up as so we've got if we've got successes with good crops I also put failures up so if we have a field that's failed or if we have a wet part to a field I don't only put things up that show me in a good light yeah I put things up that show how the um I put things up that show how the weather uh, impacts on yeah. us like that so YouTube for me and and that and I've called that uh, Wardy's waffle and yeah. so that's known on YouTube or that I can be found that way, or just put in Andrew Ward and I can be found that way. Various ways. And, and I think social media is is very powerful. Um, mm, definitely. I, I was told once by somebody that you'll know that uh, it's like a tube of toothpaste. Once it's out, you can't get it back. <laughs> so, so you need to be very careful and making sure what you put out there because you can't retract it. Oh, absolutely! Reputation is is king, isn't it? You yeah. know, you, you go, yeah, yeah, you you, you got to yeah, yeah. You just got to be careful about what. You, but but I like the fact that you are showcasing the reality of farming, warts and all, rather than just living your best life, which uh, yeah. you know you see a lot of the time. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, I only thought the other day I was in my greenhouse. I mean, I, I grow a lot of veg in my kitchen garden, mm. and and I was going to do a post about my failures because at the moment I've been you know posting lots of great pictures on all the things I'm growing, and then I'm a bit like, well, actually. I ought to show that, you know, there's there's all this good stuff, but then there's all this stuff that I've tried to get going mm -hmm. and it's it, it's completely failed. And it is yeah. that kind of highs and lows, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and I think that just shows the reality um, of, of life on the farm. It, yeah, and it shows how much the weather has an impact on what we do. Because mm. often a lot of failures, are, you know, are down to the weather. They're sometimes down to us, but they're down to the weather. But mm. with me, I'm never a, a, afraid to make a mistake because if you don't make a mistake, you you uh, you often don't learn. You learn mm. by mistakes. Yeah. I think the most important thing is not to make the same mistake twice. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, here are some time-saving hacks for you to try at home. Well. We can't talk about baked beans and not involve them in a time-saving hack, can we? Everyone knows how quick, simple and easy beans are to prepare as a quick mealtime filler. But have you ever made one of these cheesy bean bakes with ready roll pastry? A quick lunchtime snack. So take some ready roll pastry and cut into a rectangle. Place two small rectangles of cheese and a two spoonfuls of baked beans either side of the cheese. Fold over like a pan of chocolat brush with a bit of milk or egg and bake for about 20 minutes until golden. If you check out the Heinz Instagram account, you'll find a whole lot of inspo of different things you can do with baked beans. And I'm going to be recreating this one too. Now, I've had a lovely voice note from a listener of the show who has a brilliant recipe using beans. So let's hear it now. This one goes down well in our house because it involves sausages and every kid loves sausages. And it's also got baked beans in it and kids love beans too. Well, mine do anyway. Sausage and beans. So it's a sausage casserole recipe. Uh, it's uh, I fry off one onion with eight sausages in a frying pan just to brown off the sausages. Then I get my old favourite slow cooker out. I then add three chopped carrots one tin of baked beans, one tin of cannellini beans, one carton of tomatoes in onion and garlic. You know, you can buy the chopped tomatoes with the onion and garlic mix in it. One beef stock cube with a cup of water, a packet of butter and mushrooms. And then I have a good shake of sage, parsley and thyme in there. And then a good old shake of Worcester sauce. And then leave that to cook through for as long as you need in your slow cooker. And I serve it up with a bit of mash. Wow. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ellie. That is a fantastic recipe and so apt considering that we have been talking about baked beans on this episode. Now, if like Ellie, you have a wonderful recipe to share, 
please send your voice note via WhatsApp or drop me an email at hello at milliefife.com. It is always fantastic to hear from all of the supporters and listeners of the Countryside Kitchen Meats Food and Farming podcast. In season right now, August, runner beans, main crop potatoes, sweet corn, tomatoes, cucumbers, all of this produce is packed full of goodness and grown here in the British Isles. I grow all of these things in my garden and I always bang on about how super sweet, tasty, homegrown sweet corn is. I grow a lot of it and I can't get enough. All you need to do is boil it up for about 10 minutes and then smother it in butter and enjoy. That is my ideal summer dish. How does that sound, Wardy? Absolutely fantastic. There's two things there well, that just pop my eyes open. Cheese, for one. I think <laughs> cheese is just so underrated. Mm. It just everything out in the food and the other thing is butter and I know both those things you say you've got to be careful because of cholesterol but for me there's nothing better than having a having something that you put your butter on and when you bite into it you can see teeth marks (laughs) it's bad for you but it's lovely well it's everything in moderation isn't it I think, you know, part of a balanced diet and I think whole food as well. I mean, I'm big into obviously scratch cooking, whole food and, you know, getting away from this ultra processed food as well, mm-hmm. because, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's what, you know, it's good for mind, body and soul to eat, you know, whole good food from scratch. Yeah. And if it's local, yeah. even better. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's all we've got time for today. Don't forget to tune into the next episode of the Countryside Kitchen Meats, which is on the first of each month. You can subscribe on all major podcast streaming platforms and get in touch. Would you like to be on a future episode? How about sponsoring a future episode? Want to chat to me about what you do and share some recipes too? Drop me a line at hello at millie5.com. And you can also follow my feed blog, which is No Fuss Meals for Busy Parents on Facebook, Instagram and at www.nofussmealsforbusyparents.com for more top tips, time-saving hacks and recipe ideas. Thank you so much for joining me, Rordy. I've so much enjoyed learning more about your world and about the baked bean growing trial. I will watch you and find out more information and just sort of, yeah, just share away. Just keep me keep me posted on how it's all going, won't you? I will. Thanks, Millie. Thank you very much for asking me on. Anybody can keep up to date with the baked bean trial simply looking at Twitter or YouTube if we're there. But no, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. It's been brilliant. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. And stay tuned. See you next time. Bye.